last night uh, I stayed in a cottage on a farm uh, just outside Nyukhomka. Um, arrived very late after seven driving at night which I always try and avoid but the puncture yesterday uh, lost me a lot of time so this morning on to the hell so from Liu Khomka to Prince Albert from Prince Albert to the hell Well, I've just completed the Swatbach Pass on the way to DL. And if you're afraid of heights as I am, it's a little nerve wracking. I met a couple of vehicles and we managed vehicles coming the other way while I was ascending they were descending and with maneuverability on both of our parts they were able to pass the track is very narrow and there are steep descents I have to admit I didn't see very much of it because I wasn't looking down Now, this is the road to DL. And there's a signboard back there saying, dangerous road for the next 48 kilometers. Use at your own risk. That doesn't fill me with confidence and I have no idea what to expect. The first part of the road which I'm on now looks very placid, normal. I have no idea what to expect. Travel time is at least two hours, another board said. So, we will see. I am apprehensive. I do not do heights well. The organism in the brain keeps saying, this is bad. This is not good. This is bad. You're going to fall to your death. You're going to die. And it doesn't matter how much logic and rationality you use, the organism will not be silenced. Here we go.
Well, I'm at the hell. After 48 kilometers of an extraordinary road, mountain pass, the Otto de Plessis Pass, better known as the road to the hell. I think one of the most frightening uh, passes I've ever driven, possibly one of the most frightening things I've ever done in my life. I met somebody a couple of days before doing this journey. I met them at Tanqua. And this is a gentleman and his wife who have traveled up to South Sudan and back. And he said to me, um, he asked me, have you traveled Sani Pass? And I said to him, yes, I had. And he said, well, no different to that. It's about the same. Um, well, I can say to you, having now done both, Sani Pass is a doddle. It's a walk in the park in comparison to the road to Diel. The last 15 kilometers of this road, particularly the last five, are frightening. If you suffer from vertigo, absolutely frightening. Hairpin bends the sharpest I've ever encountered, much worse than Sani Pass. On Sani Pass, I think there were two hairpin bends, which I needed to do uh, a three-point turn. This vehicle turns a little like the Titanic, and so there it can be a problem. This was far worse than No, I wouldn't. Am I glad I've been to Diel? Yes, well worth seeing, wonderful to see. But I wouldn't do it again. Not unless you paid me a great deal of money, as much money as that nice Gupta family has stolen from South Africa. Not less than that. Having said that, should you do it? Yes, undoubtedly you should do it. It's well worth it. Provided you don't suffer from vertigo or nobody in your vehicle suffers from vertigo. If they do or you do, you're gonna find it very, very stressful. I'm afraid that this pass classifies me as a sissy. I've got no problem with that. I found it frightening. And if you suffer from vertigo, then join me, please, as a sissy. Don't do it. It's simply too stressful. Uh, there are people that travel this pass terribly fast. I think 
my average speed was certainly less than 20 kilometers an hour. Um, in most parts I was tr probably traveling between 15 and 20 kilometers an hour and on many parts between 1 and 2 kilometers an hour, particularly around the hairpin bends. Again, low range will give you a lot more control of the vehicle. The last part of the descent into the hell, because you are now coming down the mountain onto the valley floor. And this is a long valley. You drop on the descent between 4,000 and 5,000 meters in about 5 kilometers. So the descent that you are taking is down around hairpin bends, down around hairpin bends. Um, fascinating place, fascinating history. How people here managed to survive, I do not know. Apparently it's a very agriculturally rich area. Good rainfall, all the water comes down from the mountains into the valley. And here comes a visitor. Hello, that's the third vehicle in today, which has been more than the other days have been two or th two vehicles mainly, I think, two or three. Yeah, this is the th third vehicle today. Somebody waved at me. They weren't in tears, which is nice to see. But I've been here now for th three days. Yes, and I was saying, agriculturally very rich. The people that lived here initially, and there were four, five, six families that initially moved in here. A great valley for farming because of the water and the soil is apparently very nutrient rich. It's very difficult to get out. It literally had to be done on foot with a donkey carrying your stuff, but you would have to walk your way out. There was no road. I think the road was built, the Otto du Plessis Pass was built in 1962. And that was only built because the Khamka Dam was built. Before then, people would follow the river, walking, following the river out. And when the Khamka Dam was built, that exit was closed off. There was no way out. And the administrator of the Cape at that time then gave assurance that a road would be built and then in 62 the road began commencement it took five years i think to build the pass and was done with manual labor and a bulldozer quite extraordinary i do wish they'd made it a little wider but nevertheless an absolute feat Yes, that sign you see at the beginning, after the Swartberg Pass, says to you, dangerous road, travel at your own risk, travel time two hours. I don't think it can be done in two hours, certainly not safely. Give yourself four hours. You've got another 14 kilometers of gravel to travel to get to Cape Nature's office. So if you're staying in the valley, uh, and renting one of these cottages, you will have to do those 14 kilometers of relatively slow road and then from there back to wherever your cottage is. So I would say after, once you hit that road where you see two hours travel time, double it, make it four hours and you'll be safe. As for the cottages, the cottages are all restored original cottages of the inhabitants that lived here. I think the last inhabitant left in about 1976 and gradually after the pass was built and the road was opened the inhabitants started leaving and the population became less and less because there was no way out. Um, so these cottages are, are restored there are gas geysers, which work quite effectively. There is water, 
it's not particularly pure water, it's borehole water. Uh, and then, very interestingly, um, for electricity, um, they use solar panels. I think three solar panels, of about 100, 120 watt each, to power each cottage. And you say, well, that's quite a lot. Yes, it is, because it runs through an inverter, strangely enough, to power a 220-volt AC fridge. And you say, well, why didn't they make these gas fridges? That would have been more practical. And I think they didn't make them gas fridges, because getting gas canisters in here on a regular basis would be a logistic challenge. So they did as much as they could using solar. Um, but it's not very effective because the panels are not very well aligned, in my opinion, for winter. Uh, they may be perfect for summer, I don't know. A couple of drops of rain are falling. These clouds are not thick. I do not even want to think about traveling that pass tomorrow morning in rain. I do not want to think about it. I do not want to think about it. Well, here we are at the start of the pass, leaving the hell. Full of confidence. It's going to be a doddle, a walk in the park. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. And that's that four or five hundred meter descent in about five kilometers. Yeah, that's over. Me, I'm happy. Still a couple of hairy areas ahead, but nothing compared to those last five kilometers. Ah. Now this vehicle performs so well in low range, it really is remarkable. And those five kilometers are all first for me, first and second gear low range. There was a vehicle behind me and I pulled over right against the mountain to let him get past and he told me he thought this was fun but then he probably also bungee jumps 
Anyway, I'm now much more relaxed. And I think I can start to actually enjoy the rest of the trip. Well, here I am, back at the start of the Otto Duplessis uh, road to DL. I left at 8 and it's now just about half past 10. So two and a half hours. Yeah, I reckon this road could be done in two hours at a push. Um, but then again, you've still got the other 14 kilometers once you've reached the end of the, the pass itself. Another 14 kilometers um, into the, the Cape Nature Reserve. I, I must say that the return journey was a lot less harrowing than the entering journey. I think mainly because I knew what to expect and there weren't any surprises. So really, probably not as bad as I initially made out. Uh, it's the last 5Ks, the 5Ks descending the four or five hundred meters down into the valley, to the valley floor. And that descent is over a period or a distance or about. Uh, five kilometers, so it's quite hairy. Hairpin bends, uh, very sharp hairpin bends, too sharp for this vehicle. Uh, three point turns were needed on two of the hairpin bends. Um, so, yeah, back safely. I'm glad I did it. I probably could do it again and I think it's a question of once you know what to expect your head can deal with it and then that little organism in the brain stops shrieking you're going to die you're going to die stop go back so yes the return journey was certainly um, easier less harrowing now on to Prince Albert and then to Beaufort West to the Karua National Park. One, one, just one night's camping.